Great, well here we are um, and I'd love to welcome Dave Bookless to this chat conversation. And this is very timely because we've got COP26 on the horizon and Dave Bookless is um, Director of Theology at Arosha International and has a long standing interest in matching or linking theological insight and teaching to biodiversity conservation. So Dave, if, you, if you'd like to explain a little bit about your background as well. Oh, you're muted, hold on. I'll mute myself, there we go. Um, so I've, I've been involved with Arosha for well over 20 years and been involved in environmental issues for probably about 30 years, I guess. Um, but that wasn't always my plan. I, I, um, I left university, became a teacher, then felt a call to ordination in the Church of England, so became a curate and then a vicar, and imagined that I would stay in, in full-time church leadership. Um, but then God increasingly kind of put environmental concerns on my heart, and I kind of realised more and more that this was something that the Bible spoke about an awful lot, and yet I had hardly ever heard about in churches or theological colleges. And um, so I started reading, I started exploring and then stumbled across Arosha as a bunch of Christians who were actually doing something about this at that time in Portugal, now all over the world, and um, got involved. And so got involved more and more, ended up doing a part time PhD on theology and conservation, um, ended up co-founding Arosha UK with my wife um, and doing a big practical project in, in multiracial London. Uh, and then ended up moving to Arosha International um, in my current role. So very briefly, that's a kind of summary of how I've ended up doing this. Oh my goodness, that is just speaks of a wealth of experience um, and insight. And that, that's really important as it's led to this moment in time where we're, we're looking at this um, conference summit coming up. And there's been a lot of controversy about it. There's been a lot of uncertainty about who might be there. So could I ask you what your hopes are in the short term, really, for COP26? Yes, I think just, just to put it in context, um, the COP26 means it's the 26th Conference of Parties under the UN um, Climate Change Convention. And these conferences normally happen every year. Last year was missed because of the pandemic. And every five years is a particularly significant one where nations are asked to come up with their nationally determined contributions, what they as a country are going to do. And that kind of sets the agenda for the next five years. And this is the fifth conference from the very significant one in Paris, um, COP21, where the world committed itself to trying to get as close as possible to uh, a temperature rise of no more than 1.5 degrees and certainly under two degrees. And um, so this is critical because our window of opportunity for changing things is narrowing rapidly. And this is the biggest COP for the next five years. And who knows how much more chaotic the world might well be in climate terms in five years time. So this is really significant. Um, and that's why it's so important that countries are coming up with their targets, the dates they aim to get to net zero by, um, and how much they're going to try and move away from fossil fuels. So that's that's the biggest thing really. And, and it's a mixed bag. Some countries are, are doing quite well. Um, it's encouraging to see that the U US have changed direction completely under their current president. Mm. Um, it's encouraging that even if at the last minute and without much detail, Australia have finally come in with a commitment but there are still very big countries that, that haven't done enough. Uh, and there are lots of countries, our own included, where their targets and their policies don't really match up. Um, and although they say they're aiming for net zero by 2050 or 2060 in some cases, it's really impossible to see how the direction that their planning and policies are going at the moment will actually get them there. And 2050 isn't even going to be good enough, is it? Because people are talking about aiming for 2030. Well, abs absolutely. And I'm, I'm also a Church of England minister and, and we in the Church of England have committed to trying to get to net zero um, by 2030. Um, we, we don't even know if that's possible, but it's an important target because it means we're taking this seriously and acting now 
rather than saying we can act in five or 10 years time. And, and that's the danger with politicians is most of them are elected for four or five year terms. And it's difficult for them to think further down the road. And yet what we do now will drastically affect the kind of world we have in 2030 and even more in 2050. Mm. Oh, that's such a great um, summary. That's really helpful. Thank you. That uh, um, also makes us think about what if our politicians are not giving us a coherent policy to take us in the right direction, it begs the question of what, what we can do on the streets, um, how we can become involved in a, in a really positive way. I, I think that's a really important question and, and it's interesting. Greta Thunberg um, just last week said something quite similar that we, we do need to put pressure on our politicians, but we also need popular action at, at the local, national, international level. We need people to recognize this is up to all of us. We can't just say, oh, the politicians aren't doing anything and shrug our shoulders. Um, it, it takes all of it. And, and it's why I believe that we need both the, the careful engagement with our politicians, the negotiations. We need Christians and non-Christians at levels of at high levels in science and in politics. Mm. Um, I had the privilege of speaking to Christians in Parliament the other day and and what those MPs and, and peers are able to do is, is really important. Mm. But at the same level, I, I actually think it's really important. We have pressure groups like Extinction Rebellion um, and others who will be out on the streets and marching and protesting and writing to their MPs and doing the little local things as well, choosing to move to an electric car, choosing to change their electricity supplier, mm. choosing to walk or cycle when they can, um, choosing to move to a, a less meat intensive diet because that's one of the simplest things we can do to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, all those things from the, the kind of political to the, uh, to the individual are really important on this. And, and, and I think we need all of them. Mm. I would agree. Yeah, that's great encouragement to people as well, that every action counts. Every bit of litter picked up and everything recycled yes. and absolutely yeah. every bit of plastic packaging put back on the shelf and not purchased sends a message. Yes, that gives us encouragement. And I think that's important, too, when we look at the situation and um, where we find our encouragement as Christians, of course, comes from the word of God and the actions of God through our lives and um, that's clearly something that's been really important and you've lived and breathed that. Yeah I mean it's I you know people people often ask me about how do you keep going when things are so depressing and things are getting worse all the time people often ask me where does your hope come from uh, and and I have to be honest and say that if it, if it wasn't for my Christian faith I would be pretty pessimistic uh, about our chances of actually uh, making real difference. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I do get encouragement and hope from seeing, for instance, the attitudes of younger people mm -hmm. on this and the leadership that not all but many young people are giving us on this issue and their, their moral outrage um, at, at what's happening and at the often laziness of my generation on, on this issue. Um, I get encouragement by that. I get encouragement when I before the pandemic particularly and now online travel um, and and see that in many other countries people are taking this far more seriously than we are here in the UK mm -hmm. because this isn't a, a future danger this is a current reality um, if you live in much of, of tropical Africa if you live in the Pacific states even if you live in big countries like India and China climate change is affecting things drastically now mm -hmm. um, so I get it, I get hope from that, but but most of all, I, I get hope from the big story of the Bible that God is committed to his whole creation and that the saving work of Jesus is not just about individuals. Uh, it's not just about human society. It's about God's good purposes that the whole of creation will be liberated from its bondage to decay. And um, and that doesn't mean we sit back and say, oh, well, God's going to sort it out. We don't need to bother. Um, when people ask that question, I always point them to the example of Noah. Um, and, and there's an example where there was a, a crisis, a, a major climate crisis in a way, mm. and, and yet God called on a human being 
to take the lead in, in doing something about it mm -hmm. and to be prepared to take action that others thought was ridiculous and over the top and out of all proportion to what was going on because they didn't see the scale of what was coming. And all of that's true now. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was action that wasn't just for people, it was action for all species. Mm -hmm. They were all included on the ark. So I think there's, there's an awful lot in that Noah story for us today. And of course, there's hope in that story too, because it's a story that ends, you know, there's a lot of destruction, there's a lot of death, and we, we mustn't shy away from that. There are no, uh, you know, there are no sort of rose tinted spectacles through which we can see this, this how this is going to play out. There's going to be terrible suffering in our world over the next decades. And whatever we do now, that will still happen to some extent. We can lessen it greatly, but it will still happen. So we need to have that sadness, that lament, that grief. Mm. But through that, we can also have the hope that, you know, God's promise with the rainbow, a promise to you and your descendants and every living creature on the earth. Mm. Um, a promise of God's God's restoration and redemption for all creation and that that is the big hope that keeps me motivated and keeps me going mm. oh thank you for that that's really encouraging for everybody listening to this I've seen quite a few rainbows recently and I've noted them <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we have to don't we, <laughs> we, do. we do. Yeah. oh for um, everybody watching this, I'd just like to add that Dave is going to speak more in detail about um, where the Bible relates to creation care and our hope in the Bible and about preaching on creation care at the um, Creation Hope webinar we're running this coming Tuesday. That'll be Tuesday the 2nd of November from 12 till 1. And you'll find that on the Preach web website, to, to the link to log in. And if you're watching afterwards, you will also find more resources there too. So I'd like to say thank you so much today for joining us at this very, very timely moment. And we will watch with care what comes out of COP26. And a few of us might be encouraged to write to our MPs and um, do some serious thinking about diet and purchasing habits along the way. So thanks so much, Dave, for sparing us time today. Thank you, Louisa. It's good yeah. to speak to you. Oh, that's great.